So I'm going to talk about these random projections for conic programs. I've been working with random projections before, but uh, so far they've been limited to uh, linear programs. Oh, did I switch on my video? Is that on? Yes, yes. Um, they've been limited to um, LPs and uh, QPs, so linear programs and quadratic programs. And now, uh, together with uh, Pierre-Louis Parion and uh, Vu Kaki, uh, we, um, we tackled uh, conic programs uh, altogether, uh, meaning that we are using uh, the mathematical language of uh, Jordan algebras. And so we uh, derived a theory that supports uh, the conclusion that you can safely use these things, well, safely, no, not very safely, but you can use these things in practice to get approximate solutions for very large uh, SDPs, uh, for example, or very large RPs, or for that matter, even very large SOCPs, but I haven't tested them yet. So anyway, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, first, I'll explain what random projections are and what their native application really is. And then I'll introduce formally real Jordan algebras. And then I'll move on to random projections for symmetric cone programs. Uh, and then there are three sections, projected feasibility, optimality, and solution retrieval, which are very standard, meaning that every time we've applied random projections to a, um, a mathematical programming formulation, we've had to settle these three issues, projected feasibility, projected optimality, and solution retrieval. And then I'll talk about, if, as, as time warrants, I'll talk about computational validation, which is on random instances, um, but also ap actual, um, you know, real applications, in meaning that useful applications. Um, quantile regression used in the energy industry for a couple of problems, and then error correcting codes. Uh, so the gist of random projections is that you're going to take, you, you're going to consider this blue matrix A um, as your data matrix. Um, and the columns of A are important to you, okay? So you'd, you'd like to do something to the columns of A. For example, you'd like to cluster them. Um, if you imagine that you are, I don't know, YouTube, then the columns of A are uh, encodings of uh, videos and they are huge. And uh, you'd like to cluster them according to similarity. I know this is not how they do it, but you know, just for the sake of argument. And then if you had to do that, for example, with k-means, um, the computational cost would be horrendous because they would that would be proportional to the uh, size of the columns of A, okay? Uh, but there's a, um, a way to make these columns shorter uh, whilst keeping some of the properties of the columns invariant, okay? And uh, that method consists in a short and fat matrix T, the green one, which is T, D, uh, sorry, D times M, okay? And so um, A would be... Uh, M times uh, N, okay? And then by pre-multiplying A by T, you get this matrix T times A, which now has the N columns of A, but now they're as short as D, okay? And D is much smaller than M. So there's a lot of saving there. Now you can cluster the columns of T A and hope that it provides a similar clustering to the columns of A. And why should you do that? Because these, um, if you sample T with the correct from the correct distribution, uh, you're going to find out that for every pair of columns in A, in the original uh, matrix A, uh, the uh, Euclidean distance is approximately the same as the Euclidean distance between the corresponding columns of TA. Okay, so that's an approximate congruence for every I less than J. Okay, and then you're going to find out that this happens WAP. I'm going to uh, explain this WAP later on, okay? Um, but it's, it's a kind of modifier. Um, all right, so we are in the rest of this, uh, of this uh, presentation. I'm going to um, show you that this thing does not just, I mean, this, uh, this pre-multiplication from T to A does not just uh, guarantee approximate congruence. It also guarantees that the um, feasibility and optimality properties of symmetric cone programs um, is also approximately invariant. Okay, so that's that's a much different statement uh, that has to do not just with data but with um, infinite sets, meaning that decision variables are essentially encodings of infinite sets. Anything, you know, all the values that they that can uh, take, um, uh, and that also happens. WAP, uh, whatever that means for them. Um, and the point is that now instead of having however many constraints there are here, you're going to have many fewer. Okay, so. Uh, your solver will be happier. Okay, so and that's the useful. So that's the gist of what I'm going to say. Okay, and uh, let's move on. So WAP. 
WAP stands for with arbitrarily high probability. And it's a sort of a behavior, it's an asymptotic behavior of a sequence of events ED, okay, and that depends on some parameter D, um, and uh, the probability uh, that ED, I'm sorry, that's not a K, that's a D, that ED holds is approximately equal to one over an exponential of minus D, okay? So um, overall, if D increases moderately so, you're going to have a very high probability of uh, the statement happening um, WAP. Oh, by the way, any questions are welcome, meaning that I feel all alone here. I'm talking to my screen, and that's why I hate the Zoom presentations. So if you want to make your voice heard, just uh, you know, speak over me and I'll interrupt and, and listen to the question, okay? Uh, and I, I can't- I was wondering if, uh, if this is re just quickly related, re related to the, Sketch matrix approach? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, it's related. Um, they, um, so sketching, matrix sketching and random projections, they are um, essentially two names for very similar things. I'm not gonna say that they're the same because they're not, but much of the underlying theory is similar or at least stems from uh, this uh, result, Johnson Linda Schlemma that I have, have now on the slide. Um, um, but many of the results that were derived uh, in the context of uh, matrix sketching uh, were, um, were new and went outside of the domain of the jo Johnson Linder Strauss Lemma. And so, so there's a, that contributed, it's, it's, for me, it's a unique body of theory, okay? But the applications are usually a little different. I'm not gonna say they're very different, but they're a little different. Can I go on? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so anyone else, please interrupt me. That's fine. Um, so Johnson Industrial Lemma, um, I've marked it as a theorem because it's uh, very important, but in fact, it's stated as a lemma in the in the original uh, paper by Johnson and uh, By the way, it's stated as a lemma introductory to another theorem that nobody remembers. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, sometimes the story of theorems. Okay, so anyway, so the theorem says whatever I explained to you uh, before, but it explains on top of that, um, the fact that the approximate congruence is now a multiplicative factor, okay? So it's a sandwich between multiplicative factors by one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon, okay? So, but you have this matrix A, which has columns, which has N columns in RM, and there is um, this and given epsilon, which is kind of a tolerance or error with respect to the approximation of the congruence. And now it also makes, we, are, we also know what D is. As you can see, D is um, more or less one over epsilon squared. So that's bad, but it's constant times logarithm of the number of columns, okay? That's extremely good, okay? Because it doesn't even depend on the original M, okay? So D is, could be quite small, okay? And now the theorem says that there exists a D times M matrix T that has the property here. For every two columns in the matrix, um, the two norms um, are related in this fashion, meaning that the uh, projected distances are within one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon, the original distances, okay? So that's, uh, that's a very useful thing to know. Um, so how do you sample this matrix T? In fact, there's many matrices T that are fine. And in fact, um, T is sampled component-wise. Well, one of the ways to sample is component-wise from this distribution, the normal distribution centered at zero with a certain, uh, with a certain uh, standard deviation, okay? Uh, standard deviation is actually a scaling factor, so that's not very important. Um, all right, so the, uh, the proof is probabilistic in nature and it proves that A and T times A are approximately congruent uh, with a certain probability, okay? Greater than or equal to one over N. That seems small, but of course you can make it as large as you want by the union bound and then the result follows by probabilistic method. So this is a constructive kind of proof um, that also lets you uh, devise an algorithm, a probabilistic algorithm for sampling T. Um, and uh, these are things that I already said, but, uh, oh yes, well, when you do it in practice, uh, although in order to ensure that every pair uh, projects well, okay, um, in order to ensure that, you would have to resample many times and then check whether this sampling is fine and check is, checking is costly because you'd have to, 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 um, to verify a distance matrix. 
Um, however, I always empirically sample T very few times. And for example, once, okay? And all of the experiments here sample T once. Um, why does that work? Well, it works because the theorem really is built on two uh, statements. First, you prove that on average things work anyhow, okay? So that's an important statement. And then it's, you know, uh, the uh, difficult part of the theorem of the proof of uh, Johnson and Schoss lemma is to show that the probability of error decreases exponentially fast. So even if you sample it once, um, it's going to be very empirically, very unlikely that many pairs here will not uh, abide by this uh, approximate congruence, okay? In fact, what's gonna happen is that most of the pairs will be fine here, and maybe a few pairs will not be fine. But then when you cluster with k-means over masses and masses of data, you don't even know whether the data are correct. The fact that there's a little error coming from the method is not that important to the result. So this is why um, things are fine, even if you just sample it once. And this is one of the very strong suits, I think, of uh, using random project projections in practice. And uh, I will say again that it's surprising that D, the lower dimensional, the, the, the dimensionality of the lower dimensional space is independent of the original number of dimensions M, okay? It only depends on N. Okie doke. So um, this is as far as it goes for projecting uh, data, okay? And those were the regional field of application uh, of random projection, so that, that's that's quite natural. But now I'm doing something different. I'm projecting mathematical programming formulations, which is an altogether different in, uh, uh, endeavor, okay? So um, if we want to project uh, mathematical programming uh, formulations, of course, we can only project the numbers inside, okay? So somehow I want to project the parameters of a mathematical programming formulation, i.e. the input data. Um, and I would like to ensure approximate feasibility and optimality. And I also would like to retrieve a solution of the original mathematical program, okay? Um, so these are the three things, the three tasks that I'm going to have to discuss for the SDP. Um, the difficulties um, on top of the, you know, the, that, I, that are added to the task by the fact that I want to apply random projections to mathematical programming formulations are, the main difficulties are two, in my opinion. Okay, first of all, the fact that approximate congruence yields approximate optimality is non-trivial. And secondly, uh, JLL projects finite point sets. You always, you know, your, your D, your lower dimensional, uh, your, lo your lower dimension is a logarithm of the number of points in the set, okay? So the number of columns in the matrix. Um, and that's not true if you end up projecting decision variables, okay? Meaning that you, you're projecting some matrix, some data matrix, which acts on a set of decision variables. And as, as, a, as a result of this uh, projection, uh, you end up having to reduce the number of decision variables. So you're effectively pr projecting the decision variables and they represent infinite sets, okay? Meaning that, um, you know, maybe the, uh, the um, uh, feasible set can be infinite, uh, even uncountable. So, the JLL doesn't exactly apply blindly. And so it's always, uh, there's always a lot of difficulty in applying these kind of techniques to a new class of random of mathematical programs. So, so far what's been done is linear programming and quadratic programming and also quadratic programming over a ball. And now I'm showing results for SDP and all, in fact, all conic programs, uh, symmetric conic programs. Um, okay, sorry, I'm going on. Um, so we work to, to um, you know, to solve the problem once and for all, for all symmetric conic programs. We uh, work in the framework of, of uh, formally real Jordan algebras. Um, programming over a Jordan algebra uh, entails solving these kind of uh, LPs over some weird cone, okay? And so this calligraphic K is a closed convex pointed cone with a non-empty interior. Um, and um, in fact, it denotes the cone of squares of a formerly real journal algebra, which is uh, henceforth called FRJA. Uh, FRJAs are going to be introduced next, so I don't expect you to understand what I said, okay? Uh, but this is what's, what's going to happen next. I'm going to provide a formal abstraction of SDP, SOCP, LP, and symmetric cones in general by means of this new uh, well, not new, it's but well-known, this well-known mathematical object, FRJA. 
And uh, the important thing is that this language will allow me to construct eigenvalues and prove a spectral theorem. From there, I can construct all sorts of, all sorts of things, including cones. All right, so a real algebra is a vector space over R with an abstract product, okay? So think of your favorite vector space, a Euclidean space, but now you can, uh, you can uh, define a product over vectors, okay? So you can uh, take two vectors and, uh, you know, it's, it's, not an, it's not an inner product, it's not an outer product, it produces an entity of the same uh, vector space, okay? So for example, this kind of product could be meaningful, uh, the component-wise product uh, that takes two vectors in our n and produces another vector in our n. Or if you take, if you talk about real symmetric matrices, then this kind of product, okay, um, uh, is um, is another meaningful example of, of these uh, real algebras. Okay, so Jordan algebras, on top of being real, they are commutative, meaning that the uh, product is co is commutative, and they are. Uh, mm, power associative, okay? So this identity holds. Um, and then on top of this, I'm going to require that the algebras are formally real, which means that if you have a sum of squares in the algebra that gives you the zero, the zero element, uh, then it necessarily follows that all of the elements are zero. So this, how, this is a sketch of how we construct cones in these, in these spaces, in these algebras. Um, given an element of the algebra, I can define the degree by looking at the largest um, integer r such that the identity of the product in E and then x and then x squared and up to x r, they're all linearly independent in the vector space, okay? And then by this, I must, if, if, uh, if a has rank, uh, r, then it follows that x to the r plus r plus one is going to be linearly dependent uh, from all of the previously uh, uh, mentioned uh, elements, of course. Right, so polynomials can be defined by means of plus and the product of the algebra, so there's no, no problem there. And now eigenvalues are, can be defined by minimal polynomials, okay, uh, just in, as in the normal algebraic world. world. Right, so armed with these things, now um, a spectral theorem can be proved that says that for every element of E, there are um, R eigenvalues where R is the rank of E and R, I'm going, I want to call them eigenvectors, but they're not. They're elements of the, of the algebra itself, um, such that the element A can be written as a weighted combination uh, by the eigenvalues times the vectors uh, the selected vector C1 to CR, okay? So C, they are, they sort of remind you of eigenvectors by means of these requirements. Well, first of all, they are idempotents. That doesn't really correspond to much. Uh, but then you have uh, the fact that uh, uh, they uh, are uh, orthogonal, okay? Having defined um, eigenvalues and polynomials and spectral theorems, I can now define the trace of an element by sum of eigenvalues of that element, okay? And the inner product can be defined in terms of the trace. And now that, that induces the norm in the, uh, in the algebra, which is simply the inner product of, um, of an element by itself. So you can see we can construct many uh, familiar uh, notions of normal algebra, I'm going to say standard algebra, um, by means of, uh, of these uh, FRJAs. And now lastly, we can say that an, an element of the algebra is, is positive semi-definite if it is a square of some other element, okay? So if uh, it has a square root in a sense, certain sense, and we're going to denote it in this way. Um, right, so um, don't read too much similarity between FRJAs and the spectral theorem within and the normal standard step spectral theorem because essentially um, in normal life you would find eigenvalues of a square uh, symmetric matrix to be real um, but uh, and the eigenvectors would be vectors okay but in this case the element of the algebra could be, could very well be a vector, okay? And the eigenvectors are the other vectors. So it's dimensionally speak is, speaking, it's not the same thing. All right, 
So now we can write primal and dual pairs of symmetric cone programs. This is the primal program. And this weird um, uh, operation is uh, simply a placeholder for that, OK? So it's a sequence of inner products between elements of the algebra, okay? the AI and the X. Um, we require also that this primal problem is bounded in this way. Okay, so that's an assumption we're making. Okay, meaning that if you have problems that you don't know are bounded, then this, this theory does not encompass them. Um, and then this is the dual, okay, and there's no mystery there. Uh, so the assumptions are, as I said, that these feasible instances are explicitly bounded by this uh, theta uh, here, and uh, also the strong SCP duality holds, okay. So these are two assumptions. They're not small, but they're not um, overly bizarre either. So we are ruling out some possibilities for this pair, meaning that given the assumptions, either P is infeasible and D unbounded, or both P and D have optima and strong duality holds, okay? Right, so let's see how we apply random projections for these symmetric cone programs. Um, here we um, introduce T as a matrix, okay? So we're going to use numbers. These are not elements, uh, elements of the algebra themselves. And we're going to define this A, K bar as elements of the algebra by simply defining it this way, okay? So each um, element of the algebra that used to be uh, a row of the sort of matrix in inverted comma <laughs> in the world of the F FRJA, um, okay, so is this is uh, pre-multiplied by a number, okay, and this um, this uh, whole sum is another element of the algebra, and it's called a bar, okay. So now this is the projected row uh, of the algebra uh, FRGA matrix uh, A, okay, um, and uh, that holds. Uh, well, for every one of these k up to d, and d is the lower dimensional space. Okay, uh, same thing holds for uh, the right hand side, and uh, this is not projected at all. The rest of the constraints are not projected. The objective function does not change, and so all that changes here in the dual is simply uh, this and that. Okay. Mm. Now, by construction, PT, the projected version, is a relaxation of, oh, I'm sorry, not this, is a relaxation of P, okay? Because we obtained uh, PT by aggregating constraints of P, okay? So almost for free, we have this uh, sense of the inequality, okay? And then I'll spend uh, the several, uh, many min more minutes proving that th there is another part that says V P uh, minus something, less than or equal to this, okay? So I'm going to sandwich that value, that optimal value of PT inside of P and v, uh, VP of minus something, okay? So, and that provides the uh, optimality uh, guarantee. Now, another thing that comes for free is the feasible solution um, of uh, the, um, a feasible solution of the dual. So meaning that if I solve, for example, the projected dual, which takes less time to solve, so it's more convenient, I get a feasible solution of the projected dual. And then by simply plugging it in, I can see that I end up with something where these are values of the original constraints in the dual, okay? Which means that these things, if I call them Y, then I've got, um, a, I've constructed a solution of the dual, of the, yes, of the original dual. So from a solution of the projected dual, it's immediate to, const to construct a solution of the original dual. Not so for the prime model. Okay, let's see projective feasibility. Um, I'm going to have to skip on many details, which makes me happy because there are many details here, even too many. Um, and um, my time is uh, now running. Well, it's not running out, but um, I don't think I'll go into all of the possible depths that I've prepared. Sorry, can all I right, so let's talk about quick question. Yes. Uh, do you have a still strong duality between PT and the DT? Do I have strong duality between PT and DT? Um, well, that's going to be, no, I don't assume that, okay? So that's part of the, the, the well, the proofs, let's say. 
So I'm going to work with just the assumption that P and D are strongly dual. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, so uh, the fact that P is feasible means that PT is going to be feasible uh, by linearity of T. T is a linear operator and it's really multiplying uh, something like AX equals to B, if you will, okay? So by linearity, if this used to be feasible, then this whole thing is feasible, all right? Um, on the other hand, uh, because this T um, is basically an aggregation of constraints, uh, PT may be feasible even if P is not, okay? And this is, of course, a bother. Um, but we're, we're going to prove that P, if P is infeasible, then PT is infeasible WAP. It's not going to be always infeasible, but at least with, with arbitrarily high probability, okay? Uh, first of all, we prove, well, uh, first of all, we know that if P is infeasible, then D is unbounded, okay? Uh, so we can, chose, we can choose YI small and nu large enough so that this is feasible, okay? And now that proves was strictly feasible, okay? And that proves that D has non-empty interior, okay? Hence, there exists a dual feasible solution uh, such that this is equal to one, okay? And this is uh, S5. Um, this comes from unboundedness, okay? Uh, now we will construct a solution Z prime, nu prime um, for DT now, okay? Uh, and it will be constructed in a way that this is going to be um, greater than zero, where, whereas this is going to be just feasible. Uh, the fact that this, that this is the body of the objective function of the dual DT, and don't forget that we were minimizing the original, so we're maximizing something, okay? Now, if you scale this by any factor, you will get something as big as you want, and you will find that uh, this simply becomes, this simply stays feasible, okay? So this shows the unboundedness, if we can construct such a pair. So we define first Z prime as T times Y hat, okay? So Y hat was the dual feasible solution that gave me these properties that are called one, okay? Now I'm going to look at uh, the right-hand sides of, of the constraints. I'm going to call them N for the uh, dual problem and N prime for the projected dual problem, okay? Um, we know that N uh, is uh, negative uh, semi-definite because the dual was feasible, but we need to prove that N prime is negative semi-definite, at least WAP, to prove that DT is feasible. And then we're gonna worry about the value of the objective function. Um, so this lemma, I would like to go into just to show you what kind of um, mathematics uh, you can do in these formal, uh, formally real Jordan algebras. Thereafter, I may skip technical results, uh, although the proof sketches are always there. Uh, well, mostly there. Uh, so the lemma sta states that the maximum eigenvalue, see, we can talk about eigenvalues of any member of the algebra, and n prime is certainly a member of the algebra. Okay, so the maximum eigenvalue is going to be less than or equal to something which is prefixed by an epsilon, and then the rest are norms, okay? Um, so ho hopefully we can make that <clears throat> right inside as small as we wish by just making choosing a small epsilon. And the, prob the probability of this happening is going to be uh, exceeding one minus an exponentially uh, falling term, okay, which is WAP. Uh, this, quanti this lemma quantifies the error with respect to the desired property, which is this one, okay? Um, and this weird norm, I defined it here, okay? But it does, it's not very important. Now the proof sketch, we're going to use these two functions, one and two, you might recognize uh, this function f and f prime, and f is for the non-projected version, and f prime is for the projected version. You might recognize uh, the uh, computation of eigenvalues there, okay? So meaning that when, uh, when we uh, maximize overall u different from zero, f prime of u and uh, f of u, we get the maximum eigenvalue, okay? So this is why we choose these quadratic forms. Um, anyway, we replace z prime by its definition in n prime, okay, here, so here, and we get uh, this expression. I'm not gonna go into the details to exp and explain why we get that expression. It's a lot of algebra, we get that expression, okay? Now we write f prime in function of a few, and again, I'm not gonna give you the details, but if you work out all the algebra, this is what comes out, 
okay? And now I've used this Z, Z tilde to shorten this term, okay? This term is important because it's expressed in terms of the uh, random projector operator. So uh, we can use the, um, the, tool, um, the tools of random projections and certainly the johnson lindstrom lemma. So again, we note that lambda max of N prime and lambda max of N are defined in, are defined in terms of F, of the functions f prime and f and also that because we know that n is negative definite and semi-definite okay here because d was feasible we also know that this lambda max of n is less than or equal to zero okay now we use the jll to evaluate uh, the uh, infinite norm of z tilde and this is a corollary to the jll but it's very easy to prove and that what, what it shows is that the infinite norm of this uh, term is bounded above by epsilon times uh, y hat okay so that's uh, that's what we use uh, to state that wap the lambda max of n prime is bounded above by lambda max of n by this uh, uh, error term and then this is less than or equal to zero, so we can we can discount it, and what remains is this, where we've replaced that with this. Okay, so finally we have proved the lemma. It's a complicated proof if you insert all of the uh, algebraic steps for transforming certain things, but the sketch is simple. So we work with eigenvalues because these are things that we can control, and other things are possibly a little more difficult to control. Anyway, so now we've worked out this error term. This is the error. We would like a lambda max of n prime to be uh, negative semi-definite, but we have an error. Now, because we have an error, we define nu uh, prime, okay? We defined uh, z prime before, now we define nu prime to construct this feasible solution in dt, in the projected dual. That is nu hat, the previous nu of the original dual, plus the error, okay? So that's what we do. We found an error, now we use that error, okay? So now the theorem says if P is infeasible and this further condition holds, then the probability that the projected P is infeasible happens, well, is high enough. It happens well, okay? So I'm not gonna go into these details um, because I think it's just an application of the lemma that I just, uh, that I just proved, okay? Now, projected optimality. Um, the proof strategy is going to be a little different here, but we're also going to have a, a lemma about a minimum eigenvalue this time, which are not going to, I'm not going to prove because it's similar to the previous lemma. Anyway, so the proof strategy here to, uh, is to consider a relaxation family of dt, the projected dual, parameterized by this scalar mu. Okay, so here what mu is serves, um, the purpose of mu is to relax the projected dual, okay? So now we don't have just the projected dual, we can, you know, relax it a little bit. So all this family relaxes the projected dual. Any value that we find is a relaxation, it's going to be higher than that of the projected dual, okay? And we uh, consider this, that the solution of d t mu tilde, these symbols, they're just too charged with, with modifiers, I'm sorry about the presentation. I mean, the symbol names should be should have been changed. So z hat and nu hat is the solution of uh, this. They are both in terms of uh, in function of mu, of mu. Okay, but we're going to show that there exists a magical value of mu such that the feasible solution uh, of uh, the um, of the dual problem is close to this. Uh, solution. So we take the solution of d t tilde mu and we uh, project the vector part. Okay, so that should be approximate invariance of uh, the original problem with respect to random projections. So again, we define z prime equal t times uh, y hat. Okay, y hat was a solution of the dual, and now m prime is going to be this value. Okay, so this value. Um, is basically worked out from this constraint. So it's going to be used to say that we want to prove that mu, sorry, m prime plus mu e is posi positive semi-definite, okay? And this, if you replace everything inside, it's just one, a version of this constraint, okay? Um, but this will yield um, that z prime nu hat, okay? So this, uh, solution that we are building and new hat are feasible in all of these family. Okay. 
And we are going to show that by establishing that the minimum eigenvalue this time of m prime is going to exceed minus mu for some suitable mu, okay? And now we have this lemma that basically gives us the value of mu, okay? This lemma says that lambda min of m, uh, hat, m prime exceeds minus epsilon times uh, stuff, okay? WAP. The proof is similar to that of lemma one, so I'm leaving it out. Um, so now, of course, we define mu with this value of the error. And now uh, by lemma two, uh, we define, well, we define d tilde, d tilde t with basically mu fixed at this value, all right? So this relaxes this, as we've seen already, and we found that this solution that we've just constructed is feasible for it, okay, for, for this, okay? So consider an optimal solution of the original dual, okay? Then we have that the probability, this is a lemma I'm not going to prove because it's not very difficult to, to prove, the, probab the, val the probability, the, the optimal value of uh, this formulation that we just constructed because we fixed mu, okay, exceeds the uh, objective function value that can be obtained by plugging in the optimal solution of the original dual D, of course, because this is a relaxation of D, okay? And that in turns, in turn exceeds the value of D minus this, okay? And this minus comes from an application of the JLL to something that was hidden. This term and this term, you can see that there's B and there's Y, and here there's B and there's Y, and there's an epsilon. So uh, this is basically uh, the uh, JLL in disguise, the uh, johnson lindes schoss lemma in disguise. All right, so now we consider the dual of this formulation that we just constructed, and we get a, a version of the primal, which is called P tilde T. And I, I am conscious, I'm, a, I'm aware that this is a mess to understand, I'm aware. Um, this is the first time that I present this, and so things will be smoother as, as long you know, as I keep presenting it. I'm, I'll find ways to simplifying it, but uh, for now I'm sorry, but this is uh, the best I can do. So we consider this uh, dual to the uh, problem that we've just constructed, and this is what comes out, okay? Uh, it's basically PT with this thing stuck on the objective. Finally, by weak duality, we have this, and then by this equation and the lemma that we've just been showing here, and uh, strong duality in P, we obtain what we wanted. The probability that V of PT exceeds VP minus something, okay? And this is, this happens well. Now, my, my idea for simplifying the presentation, uh, I only had it like, I don't know, half an hour ago. And so I couldn't redo the whole presentation, but I'm going to present the next slide. And this slide is incomprehensible, but the next slide will be more comprehensible. I decided to replace anything symbolic and messy with uh, the word stuff, okay? So by weak duality, the value of the weird dual that we've uh, the projected dual is less than of uh, the value of the projected primal, okay? So this is weak duality, okay? And uh, the value of the projected uh, primal is less than the value of the projected of the uh, projected primal plus stuff. Okay, and this was one of the theorems that we saw we've seen before. Lemma three proved that the value of the weird projected dual exceeds the value of the dual minus more stuff, different stuff. Okay. And by strong duality, we know that V of D is equal to V of P. Now these are the original problems, so we have strong duality, no problem there. Now the value of the projected primal plus stuff uh, must then be uh, exceeding the value of uh, the original uh, primal minus more stuff because we have strong duality. So I can replace this here with this here, okay? Hence, I can move this stuff to the other side and we have, or rather this stuff to the other side and we have uh, V P minus lots of stuff less than or equal to V of P T, okay? And uh, because we already knew that this was true by aggregation of constraints, we now have the sandwich relationship that I was trying to uh, prove, WAP. And WAP seems like I'm WAPing like a dog, but it's not. All right, so let's move to solution retrieval. 
in general, the solution of the projected primal problem is going to be infeasible in the original problem. Why is that? Because we've uh, aggregated constraints. Uh, so for obvious linear algebraic, uh, algebraic reasons, uh, the likelihood that this XT is feasible uh, in the original problem is zero, okay? Uh, so we need some solution retrieval because we don't just want to uh, get an estimate of the optimal uh, um, value of the of the problem. We also want a solution of the problem, of the regional problem. Okay. So we need to construct a good approximation x tilde for the original problem from the solution of the projected problem. And we could do that for free for the dual, but not for the primal. Okay. And we can't really apply. Uh, complementary, complementary slackness. We've tried that. Um, it doesn't work because we don't have the combinatorial uh, information about uh, the original primal that we would need in order to do that. So we have some values that may be close to zero, but they're not quite zero. You don't know whether they are really in the basis or outside of the basis. There are all sorts of difficulties and they hit. So we've tried that in practice. It really doesn't work. So we have a solution of the original dual, but we don't have a solution of the original primal from the solution of the projected, projected dual. On the other hand, if we solve the projected primal, we have something um, more. We have the opportunity of satisfying the original constraints, the original equality constraints. So A, now this bold face A is the matrix that realizes the abstract linear operator that maps X in the formally real Jordan algebra to this element of the formally real Jordan algebra. Okay, so we define x tilde to be xt, we've computed that, uh, plus the pseudo inverse, okay? And um, essentially, this fact uh, projects xt onto this um, uh, manifold, um, this, this, uh, this subspace, um, and that means that it, it, um, it satisfies the constraint for free, okay? So, what may happen is that this new element that we've just constructed may fail to satisfy uh, positive semi-definiteness in the formally real journal algebra, okay? Because those are two, the two constraints that we have. Um, it, we know that it satisfies Ax equals to b by design, so the, other, the, the only other constraint that it may fail to satisfy is this one here, okay? So now we have a theorem, which is more difficult than what I've proved so far, so I'm not gonna prove this theorem, that says that essentially uh, the minimum eigenvalue of x tilde is bounded below by the minimum eigenvalue of, of xt minus stuff. And that happens WAP, okay? So where this stuff is small or large will depend on the data of the problem, and it's quite difficult to handle on it. Uh, on the other hand, um, what we can do is test, and this is what I'm going to show you in the rest of the presentation, essentially. Um, so anyway, so far we have the infeasibility of P uh, implies the infeasibility of the uh, projected P. WAP. The optimality of P uh, yields a guaranteed approximation error on the optimality of the projected P, WAP. The guaranteed error on the retrieved solution of P um, uh, from the solution of uh, PT is established, uh, WAP, of course. <laughs> and uh, so the proof techniques uh, were all about duality and multiple applied applications of, uh, of duality were switched between primal and dual many times and essentially, um, you know, bounding of the eigenvalues. All right, um, let's see the computational validation. Well, if there are any questions here about the theoretical part, um, I would expect that the most probable question would be, I didn't understand anything, can you re-explain? But this question I'm going to rule against because it would, I don't have time. Any other question you can ask. Hello? Right. Yes, Felipe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's nice talk so far. Um, I, I I really did not understand uh, the specific <laughs> part, <laughs> okay. but I have a question. Yes. If, if you prefer to to answer this at the end, uh -huh. I have a question. If there is anything involved in uh, the relation of formally real Jordan algebra and projective geometry. 
because there there is a relation of the, in the spinorial thing of, of in projected what sorry between formally real journal algebras and projected what and projective geometry ah projective geometry yes okay so there is a, a, a relationship between uh, there is a, a certain type of formally real journal algebra um, is actually a Clifford algebra. Um, so yes, there is a relationship. Okay, but you you do not use this here. No, no because you are work. working with projectors, right? I we yes I'm yes, but this is these projectors. Uh, they are not well. They are far from the idea of projective geometry, as far as I can see. Uh, they are not, in fact, even project projection matrices. They are sort of a half of a projection matrix. Uh, you can make a projection matrix out of uh, my matrices T, uh, but they are not quite projection matrices. So they're called random projections because they decrease the dimensionality, but that's it. Uh, they are not yet, uh, they are sort of pre-projectors, pre if you will. So no, I'm not using the link between formally real Jordan algebras and, uh, and the Clifford algebra. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. All right. So uh, the approach to solving these things in practice is a project and solve. Okay. So we solve the original. Um, uh, well, we solve the original problem in order to get to, to verify whether we do well or not. Okay. So th this is not you know, part of the problem, in fact, but uh, it's part of my tests. Uh, so we consider the original SCP and we reduce it to standard form because we need the standard form to work with. We sample a random projector, projector T and we project the equality constraints of this symmetric home program. We solve the projected SCP, uh, what I called PT and retrieve the approximate solution x tilde. And then we, we compare the original solution and the retrieved solution. Um, and uh, we look at the infeasibility error uh, if uh, the instance was infeasible uh, and uh, comment of the CPU time, okay? So we use sparse random projectors. So they're not quite component-wise sampled from n0, one over square root of d as I described that before, uh, but they are a sort of a, a sparsification of that, okay? And uh, we want to uh, establish that infeasible Ps don't turn into infeasible Pts too often, and that the optimality and infeasibility error of uh, X um, uh, tilde is not too large, okay? Um, the validation tests um, are on random instances, and then I have some other tests that are not on random instances. So let's see the tests on the, um, oops, what am I doing? Uh, on the infeasible random linear problems. Okay, so these were infeasible by design. This is the uh, generation uh, strategy. Uh, you can see that they are, uh, they go from M equals to 500 to M equals 1500, and they go from N equals 600 to N equals uh, 2400. Um, the density varies between 0, 1 and 0, 7. So we also have very dense large LPs. So if this were the size of an LP encoding, for example, uh, the adjacency matrix of a graph, it would be tiny and CPLEX would dispose of it in a fraction of a second. But if you start looking at the sparsity here, the density is 0, 7, then this is a formidable, well, not formidable yet, but it's a, a, it's a serious LP for CPLEX, okay? Uh, so this is the random projection, uh, the randomly projected dimension. Uh, and uh, this is the original CPU time, so the time taken to solve the original LP. This is the time taken to solve the projected LP. And all of them were um, found uh, infeasible. So there's nothing wrong here. So there's 100% uh, uh, success, okay? So here each line is an average over 10 random instances. And uh, you can see that as long as we go high sizes, the difference between uh, this and that count uh, is favorable, very favorable uh, to the projected version. On feasible random LPs, these are all feasible by design, uh, we see a similar story as concerns the CPU time. We see that uh, the, the objective error, which is defined as follows, is actually quite good. I mean, we find very, very close objectives. The negativity error, so the error with respect to this, well, in fact, we are in the LP case. So with respect to this, okay, so we find some component that is slightly negative. That happens, okay? 
but it happens less on average, meaning that as the size grows, uh, this uh, negativity error uh, decreases, which is something good uh, that I expect to find in uh, random projections. All right, on infeasible random SDTs, we find again uh, total success, but we have much fewer instances. In fact, we have 10 instances here. Um, and also the success rate varies with respect to the epsilon that we choose to uh, to limit the error in the johnson linder strauss lemma. Do you remember one minus epsilon, uh, x minus y, less than or equal to, etc., less than or equal to one plus epsilon. This epsilon here is this epsilon, okay? So uh, the success rate rapidly goes to zero if epsilon increases too much, too much. Uh, for the feasible random instances, we find an enormous error uh, with respect to the objective function. You can see that the objective functions here, they're very different from that. But once we retrieve the solution, then the error with respect to the retrieve solution is nothing. Okay, so in fact, we are somehow hitting on fantastically reconstructed solutions for SDPs. I don't have any explanation so far for this uh, difference in behavior between LPs and SDPs. All right. So let's look at some uh, real problem problems now. Uh, quantile regression. Well, if for those of you who don't know what quantile regression is, it's best understood as um, uh, by analogy, okay? But let me just say that B is a random variable conditional on P random variables, A1 to AP. Uh, and we assume that B depends linearly on the AJs, okay? So this is a statistical dependence between random variables. Uh, we want to find the coefficients of this linear dependence, okay? So we want to be able to write down B equals sum of AJ times XJ, and we don't know what these are, but we can estimate them, or as we say in today's world, we learn them from data, okay? So we use samples from B and from A1 and up to AP to find estimates. Um, now, you all know what uh, mean, well, uh, regression is. Uh, well, this is the mean, computation of a mean, there's no regression here. And if you postulate the fact that the, you know, the mean is not really a number, but it's a, a linear dependence uh, on some columns of A, uh, then you are looking for an arg mean, so a vector, nu is now a vector, uh, and you're, these are the x's that I, that I wrote before, okay? So this is what we want to write, we want to find these nu j's uh, by means of plugging in data and solving this uh, uh, this optimization problem, okay? So you can do the same for the median uh, by adapting this objective function instead of sum of squares, uh, sum of square differences, this is what you get, okay? And by the median, well, you can go from the median to this conditional sample median, which is kind of the same analogical thing that happened between using a scalar here and using a vector there. Again, uh, you can use a scalar here, but now you can use a vector here, okay? So uh, this uh, zeta is a vector now. And now by analogy, quantile regression is like the median, but it's not the 0 0.5 quantile. It could be the 0 0.1 quantile, 0 0.9 quantile, or whatever other quantile, okay? Uh, so this is what it is. It's a kind of a glorified linear regression where you're not finding a regression to the mean, but to a quantile. So this quantile regression problem is actually uh, quite hard to solve because one would like to solve it for enormous amounts of data very fast, but you have to solve an LP, an LP which is typically dense. This is the LP, and you can see that this A is the data. Now the A being the data means that uh, this constraint matrix is usually quite dense. It may not be 0 0.7 dense, but even 0 0.2 dense is quite bad on a typical LP solver, okay? Right, so these are the typical things that you see on uh, quadratic regression problem constraint matrix shapes. These uh, two identities are because of the U plus and U minus. And then the rest, this is A and this is A. Um, and so these are, these are hard LP to solve. The typical output for a 2D slice is informative. And this is why people really want uh, to compute uh, uh, quantile regressions more than uh, linear regression. I've seen plenty of machine learning papers with, with clouds of points like this, and then uh, an outlier here, and they will say, ah, this is my uh, linear regression. And so obviously the experiments uh, match the theory. 
okay, to me, that is really plain false. If you see something like this, uh, there's, I can imagine, hardly imagine something, you know, more not, not completely correlated. It's not linearly correlated. It's linearly uncorrelated, something like that. Okay, so, so these, these kind of linear regressions, they are too simple for a complex phenomena. Okay, whereas if you can segment uh, these um, these quantiles and and see the uh, you know the the trend over the top ninety percent, the top eighty percent, the top sixty percent, etc., up to the top ten percent, you have much more information to make predictions. All right, so let's see how they're used in the energy industry. Um, there's two applications: one to energy prices and the other to energy production. Um, for the electricity prices, there's this uh, uh, database. Uh, that brings, you know, that lists all the electricity prices on a bunch of regions, okay? And these are the regions. I don't know what significance they have, but uh, there, I, there are two instances, in fact, that the came to me, one with 22 countries from the European zone and one from 111 origins. And uh, you can compute the tow quantile for these uh, bunch of, um, of data. Um, and for the 22 country electricity prices instance, this is the original LP, and this is the projected LP. And you can see that many of the uh, coefficients actually match, okay, but some don't. And this is interesting. In fact, um, I found uh, later on, after the fact, I found that many of the columns contained exactly the same prices because we were in Europe. And in Europe, there was a, a standardization of prices up from a certain point onwards. So these are just random permutations that, uh, you know, for some reasons to do with degeneracy, I guess, um, you know, they, they, they were chosen differently by the solver in the original problem and in the projected problem. Once you identify these permutations, then uh, the error between the original problem and the projected problem is very small. Um, this was too small of an instance in order to show the uh, impact on CPU time, uh, but on the larger instance, it was possible to show some advantage in CPU time. Now, for the other uh, application in energy production. This is a forecast uh, about wind energy production on a set of regions from, from meteorological data and also the installed production capacity per region. Okay, that's that was in France and there was a grid with weather stations. Um, essentially, uh, we have a statistical model where we're trying to, um, to, to sort of uh, estimate a function which is unknown um, and um, you have wind energy production as a, an unknown function of weather forecasts and capacity. You have all of the data for this uh, bunch of stuff, and you uh, have a statistical model coming from physics, meaning that the wind power turbine um, is a physical engine and it's regulated by this relationship. Now, we've had to sort of manipulate, handle this relationship a bit to make it a little uh, more amenable to um, learning. Uh, or estimation, as I like to call it. Uh, but then we uh, proposed this cubic model where we, we, we had to estimate the beta parameters, okay? So the beta parameters were estimated with all of the data we had, and uh, then we computed a quantile regression. Now, quantile regression um, on the original problems gave these results, and you can see that here it's not all uh, unif uniform. There are some dots in some of the betas. So many of the betas are zero, but some are not. Incredibly, there is a picture of France here. I don't know what's that uh, significance. Also, it's a very tiny value, but there you go. And these, are, these were the results with random projections. You can see that the ratio of original objectives to, um, to uh, projected um, objectives, this is a projected objective, is close to 85%, uh, so that's not too bad, okay, for an epsilon ratio of 0 0.2, and uh, instead of uh, taking 40, so this is a bunch of LPs, okay, so there were many, many LPs to, to solve, and together uh, for, for this region, for example, it was 45,000 seconds, uh, sorry, 4,500 seconds, and it was uh, a little more than half uh, the amount for the projected problem. And I think that my time is up, so I'm not going to, pre to uh, present the last application, but that doesn't matter. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Leo, for the nice talk. And now maybe people have questions. People 
made a lot of questions. I have one question. Leo, maybe you can tell me how this relates to you know, SVD decomposition, and especially when you have a small ring for the matrix, have you compared this to computing the decomposition? And, and okay, does so, the rank interfere in these uh, uh, results? No, no. Uh, I don't expect my matrix, my projected matrices to have low rank. If that is the case, I would go first for uh, reducing the rank and then if eventually perhaps project them if we still have too many constraints. Uh, but no, they are largely independent. Well, one thing that I can say, though, is that when we were working on random projections applied to quadratic programs, uh, we used SD, S, S, SVD um, a lot in the proofs. OK, so we reasoned uh, about properties by uh, applying random projections uh, to SVD processes, essentially. Uh, so so they, they cropped up in proofs, but not in computation so far. Okay. Any questions? And can... The other thing is about sparsity. Is there a way uh, to maintain the sparsity on all the theory? No, no, it's bad. That is one of the main faults of this theory. And when you apply this, uh, uh, these random projections to very structured problems, uh, you often don't, unless your problem is humongous, you often end up wasting more time than you would, you'd, you'd save. Uh, so there are a few exceptions. Um, but essentially, this is very useful for the few cases of dense LPs that are in the literature. For example, quantile regression is one. And my other uh, application that I didn't have time to, to present was a coding application, uh, which uses at a certain point um, uh, compressed sensing. Okay, so compressed sensing LPs, uh, what's called basis pursuit, they're wholly dense. And so those are fantastic. They are fantastic benchmarks because uh, you know the, the, these these techniques go much faster uh, than than the original compressed uh, compressed sensing LP. So, but sparsity is uh, a thorn in our foot. Yes, yes. And finally, I'd like to know if you didn't have any problems solving these problems with the lack of strong duality. Uh, did you observe that it was not satisfied and you okay, had problems so with solving? I can't really answer that because, uh, of course, that's not an issue in LP. And most of my tests concern LP. Uh, the tests over SDPs, they were plagued by um, a problem with the interface between Julia and the SDP solver of choice. Uh, even in cases where it shouldn't have told me that, it told me that essentially its feasible region was zero, was just the, the origin. and so. And so I couldn't test many problems. I could only test these random problems, and the random problems are not likely to be, uh, you know, problematic in that sense. Yeah. Okay. So someone else. So, so if you have, say, a, if you had an say. LP um, where you didn't have uh, strict feasibility, you think? Uh, this is not a problem? No, no. Um, I, I am positive that it's not a problem. Um, in fact, if you have something, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, uh, you know, you expressed wonderment uh, at the fact that, uh, um, you know, if you uh, do something random um, to, in the previous talk by Gabor, you, what, was you, what was it you said? You said, if you do something, I'm, I'm puzzled, I'm surprised that if you do something random to this, uh, then you uh, the problem goes away. Yeah, it was it, the the property is, is destroyed. In fact, I find it very normal. Uh, random things are average things, and so the uh, the probability zero events such as degeneracy that you only observe uh, with human constructed LPs they go away if you apply random projections. Okay, so at the cost of wasting sparsity and structure, if you have a very degenerate problem that is giving you trouble, but I don't see why an LP should give you trouble even in general, but let's say that it does give you trouble. Then if you, if you take a random projection, even without lowering rank, okay? Even if you take D equal to M, okay? You lose sparsity, 
but you uh, you essentially eliminate a lot of uh, of the problems with the uh, degeneracy. You're 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 uh, I don't know much better behaved. Now I'm I'm well, not really sure. This is not a theoretical statement I'm making. Okay, so it's, so it's an empirical things, statement. One of the problems with degeneracy showed by uh, I guess the people working on robust optimization that mm. they took all the the, the NetLib uh, library. Um, mm -hmm. And they showed that the solutions they, they get for the degenerate problems, maybe the optimal value is okay, but the solutions they get are essentially garbage. Okay, ah, okay. not all of them, but a lot of them are garbage because that's what degeneracy does. So I think uh, that's what led to robust optimization, trying well, to- Well, I'm surprised, but, you know, I thought that uh, you know uh, commercial solvers uh, for LP were now able to deal with uh, all sorts of degeneracy. Uh, you're saying the Netlib, so Netlib would be a, a, a library of LPs, right? Well, this is a good question. Commercial solvers, I think, get a solution, but nobody goes and checks whether oh, the solution makes sense. Well, and I, I think this know. is what the early people in robust optimization did. Mm. You know, the Bental Nemirovsky early paper. Yeah. This is what they showed, that uh, if you go and you solve your problem, it doesn't matter how accurate you solve your problem, but the solution you got. Okay, th that may be the case, Henry, exactly. but if, if you look at, for example, uh, special branch and bound, uh, spatial branch and bound solvers, okay, such as Baron, for example, because a single LP wrong can destroy the whole run, uh, the implement such uh, SBB algorithms, such as Nick Sahinidis, they built in uh, many years ago already um, a dual certificate, meaning that every time they solve, they, they check whether their primal solution from the LP is actually valid, and if it's not valid, what's the error and what action to take otherwise. So these, although maybe I don't know if Cplex does it immediately uh, or, or automatically, but certainly the SBB solvers, many of the SB, SBB solvers do it and they don't report you know, desperation at solving uh, a, a lot of uh, LP relaxations. You know, keep in mind that when you solve an MINLP uh, and maybe it has, I don't know, 10,000 nodes, uh, you've solved 10,000 relaxations, 10,000 LPs, some of which may be very degenerate. So, I mean, if, if, it, were, if it were a big problem now, I think we'd, I don't know, I would expect that serious solvers would check, but maybe not. Yeah, I don't know. No, I'm, yeah, I'm curious about that mm. because I know the early papers on the robust optimization. Right. They, they literally showed, well, you're going ahead and you're building a bridge, but your solution is, is really I'm not- I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure if they ever said which solver they used for, for that. Bental and Yemirsky. Well, it wasn't so much the solver as, as the fact that if you have a degenerate solution, that your solution with respect to any perturbation in the data is just um, unstable. Yeah, right. I mean, it wasn't so much the solver. So that's sort of the point that I'm making is that if you have an ill-posed problem and you have the best solver in the world, what does your solution mean? I, I don't know. I think that, so for example, uh, Dan Beanstock presented uh, a quadratic, a non-convex quadratic problem, very small size, where any solver would get it so wrong that it was impossible. This was a non-convex quadratic. So of course, you know, it was concave. And so instead of get, getting one end of the, of the, uh, of, of the objective, we would get the other end. Okay. So the, you could make the error as big as possible, as big as you wanted. But with LPs, I'm having a hard time, you know, I don't know. Yes, I know about degeneracy and how difficult it was to get around it, but I think that by now we should have gotten around it in LP. Uh, I, I don't know if it's still a problem. Well, uh, that's what the early papers with, if you take a look, if you pick up the uh, Bental Nemirovsky uh, El Gawi book, it's a big book, but uh, right at the beginning of the book, Right. You have an LP example. And the LP example has nothing to do with the solver. It just shows that if you perturb just one of the elements in the, in the data, 
by a very, very small amount, then your solution X just, just blows up. It, it doesn't make any sense. So it's more, and, it, and this is just, this is one of the problems that is in, in the NetLab library. My, my, impre problem. my impression is that these kind of problems uh, are probably um, contrived, okay? That if you sample a random problem, it's not gonna have this property. That's my impression. So if you I, I agree, um, make but then random problems are not degenerate. Random problems are not degenerate. Right, but even even human design problems, their degeneracy uh, usually means that there's a, a point that is uh, uh, that is uh, overdetermined in a certain sense. Uh, that's the kind of degeneracy that we seem to strike. So we put too many constraints. I don't know what happens, but the the kind of way that we model with. Uh, seems to be too sparse uh, and has too many constraints. And, and so it, it generates some degeneration, the kind of which uh, can be simply disposed of with any pivoting rule, any meaningful pivoting rule. I don't know, bland. That's my impression though, but I'm not an LP specialist, so I better shut up about it. So could I, could I still have a question to the talk? Yeah, uh, a more comment to the to the SDP problems you, you showed. I see that you used more or less the same M as N, the dimension of M and M. And so, if you solve it by interior point solver, like like Mossack, if you reduce M substantially, you will not really see it in in uh, in the CPU time difference because it will be dominated then by N. So if you well, many practical examples are of the type that M is much larger than N. So then for these type of examples, you would really see a speed up of your, of your method probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my testing of SDPs has been hampered by this uh, snag that we've hit. So I basically had only those, those instances by the time that I, uh, that, I, that I had time to work on it because for the past year, it's, it's been, it's been tra you know, the lack of time I've had was tragic and probably was also something to do with the, my lack of uh, drive in the pandemic. I don't know, uh, but uh, short story is I haven't tested SDPs um, enough. Maybe you know, maybe the the kind of uh, random testing that I've done is not too bad. But uh, but uh, I think that we need applications, and I don't have them yet. But you know, these the the other thing that I could say is that, and this does not answer your question, but usually these kind of papers about random projections they're wholly theoretical. I think they were being not all of them are okay, but most of them are, and I think we're being uh, very conscious and very aware of the fact that we want to apply them, and uh, and we are making every effort that we can in order to show that they are applicable in practice and they're not just you know uh, something theoretical that says that if you have a, a, an STP with a billion billion uh, variables, then you can project it. Uh, well, if you implement an SD, an interface to read SDPA format problems, that, there's loads of problems of, of all types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've realized it. Um, I wanted to sort of because this this uh, reduction to standard form, which is necessary to do the to the to do the projection, essentially means that you re-implement an SDP solver, but it's it's I'm not able to, uh, or at least I don't have the the interest, uh, the disposition. I, I would need an SDP solver that is open and to uh, to convince the implementer to to you know to pre-multiply by a random matrix. That that would be the easier easiest way out. I guess that yeah, I should probably pursue that. Hey, Michael, didn't you design an SDP solver? Do you want to be that implementer? Um, well, I at the moment I do have open source interior point solver for SDP, but okay. it's it's in MATLAB. It's it's not in Julia. But then it would be very right. easy to modify anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, but the fact that it's open source, I think it's meant to take. I'm not doing it, but you can do it. Okay. 